Hello, uh, thank you very much, David. Can you hear me okay? Just as a quick check. Yeah, I, I think the audio just went down, but it seems to be back up now. Okay, okay, great stuff. Yeah, all these always teething problems with these uh, IT elements. Um, so thank you very much for inviting us to to do a quick presentation to the Scottish Change Man Management Network webinar. My name's Stephen Revel. I'm co-founder of a company called Urban Tide. Um, and we deliver open data services to the government uh, and the public sector um, in, in Scotland and across the UK. Um, so I'm going to do a, a kind of a 25-minute presentation on open data and how it drives social change. Um, so there we go. The screen's sorry, slowly loading. Um, and obviously, this is you know about open data. So. We've just finished running a series of uh, workshops across the public sector for the Scottish Government, 27 workshops in the last year uh, to train and to capacity build uh, knowledge and skills for open data. Um, and every one of these workshops we've started with this slide because um, open data is quite a clear concept actually in terms of what it, what it is and what it, it says people need to do. Um, very simply, Open data is data and content that can be freely used, modified, and shared by anyone for any purpose. Um, so sometimes this is a difficult concept to, to get people's head around. Um, effectively, it means that once you publish your data on the internet with an open license, um, people can do with it whatever they want. Um, and, and that is a really important line to draw in the sand when we're talking about open data. So to give a very quick context of, of open data, the G8 countries, so the UK and the other, other countries, signed an open data charter in June 2013, um, which was around five key principles of open data. So all public sector organizations should be doing principle one, open data by default. All processes, governance, etc., should be managed in a way that ensures that is the default position. You're publishing your data uh, as a public asset. The second is you've got to try and improve the quality and the quantity of data that you publish. Um, it's accepted that it's not possible to publish all data as open data on day one, um, and that, that data can be published uh, more and more. Then the third is um, looking at the data to be usable by all, and we'll talk briefly about what that means, but it has to come in a number of different formats effectively so that different people can use it. So that's the, the, the normal user that wants to see some visualizations to the developer community that wants to be able to take the data and reuse it. Then got principle four, which is releasing data for improved governance. So that is issues to do with uh, improved transparency and accountability of government, effectively publishing the data that you uh, make your decisions based on improves accountability and we've got some great examples from across the globe of that uh, in this presentation. And then finally releasing data for innovation and, and that really is uh, something that says that the, the data that's held in these organizations is an asset but um, you know what else can be done with it? Can, can the data be linked together from different areas, different silos of data, can new intelligence be, be gathered or new services created? Um, so that's the, the very core basis of open data. In Scotland, um, we've got some other pieces of legislation which are, I won't go into too much detail on these today, but they're all, all important in this space. Um, and for example, we never say publish data that contravenes the Data Protection Act. It's a very important piece of legislation which we don't want to uh, contravene at all. So no, no personal data is published under open data. And then the other point to note is that in March this year, the Scottish Information Commissioner made open data a new class of data within the model publication scheme. So the model publication scheme is something that all public sector bodies uh, at least have to adhere to and say uh, what they're doing about certain elements of, of what they manage. And open data being a class of that means that you now have to indicate what data you're making available as open data and when you're going to make that data available uh, and where as well. So have a look at those if you're interested, um, and I can obviously provide some more background on it if, if you are interested in the Q&A. So the Scottish Government set out a vision uh, in 2020, for 2020 that recognises the value of data as, uh, as an asset and a public asset, uh, and you've got to make use of this data to improve public services. 
So I won't dwell on the kind of the background here. Um, and again, in the Scottish Government strategy published February 2015, it talks about the same kind of themes that we've already talked about in the G8 um, principles for open data. Um, and you can see them there as well. Just finally on the strategy piece, uh, the targets that the Scottish Government set out is that all public sector organisations should have an open data publication plan in place by December 2015. So that's nearly a year ago now. And that is effectively to say what data you plan to publish and when. It's as, it's as simple as that. And to publish data in a minimum of a three-star format by 2017. So um, the three-star format, just to add on to that, is based on this scale. Um, so very quickly, the idea of this scale is that as you go up the scale, the data becomes more reusable uh, by people that want to reuse it. So a one star is a PDF or a map image that makes the data available, but it's very difficult for people to reuse it. The next step is an Excel spreadsheet or Word document or other type of proprietary software um, publication that means the majority of people can reuse it, but not everybody can. Um, and that's why CSV or open word documents or whatever become the third step and the third star in terms of open data. We're not going to talk about four and five star today, uh, quite involved in technical uh, development um, that basically puts the data in the internet rather than being uh, files on the internet. And then very quickly, to publish open data, you need to publish the data under an open data license. And there's a couple of key options here. The main one used in the UK by public sector and by private sector publishing bodies or, or universities is the Open Government Licence, which is now version 3. Um, and this does two key things. It allows people the opportunity to use the data, be of charge, do whatever they want with it, exploit the information commercially and non-commercially, for example. But it also protects the organisation publishing the data. Uh, so there's elements around it that make sure that um, there's no bite back, basically, if, for example, the data is wrong or incorrect, or if the data ceases to be there in a year's time um, and people have built services or, or applications off it, um, there's no bite back for the organization that publishes it. So it, it kind of helps both the publishing organization and, and the reuser of the data. So to move on to the main element of, of today's discussion, that's the impact of open data. So, very difficult to actually look at quantifying or qualifying social impact of open data. So um, basically the best bodies in this field, including the, the ODI, the Open Data Institute, uh, have kind of, I suppose, struggled with really quantifying it. There's a lot of qualitative examples um, and a lot of qualitative examples we'll, we'll share today and also some quantitative examples. But what the ODI have done um, is basically separate the impact of open data uh, into four different areas, effectively. Um, so you can see them here, improving government, government, empowering citizens, solving public problems, and creating opportunities with the data. So they're the four key areas that the ODI have broken potential social impact, positive social impact of open data into. And I've got some examples, basically, to, to back that up. Um, there has been quite a lot of work done previously on looking at the economic impact of open data. So even just looking at the economic impact can be said to be some sort of a social impact. Um, a number of reports published by groups such as McKinsey uh, and others that have done some research in the area and estimated global market powered by open data from all section, sectors would create an additional three trillion to five trillion a year. Uh, on, on the sort of GDP of the world, and I think that's an increase of about 4% on the GDP of the world, if all public sector data that could be open data was made open data. Um, you think that the European Data Portal uh, looking, pr providing some insight and saying that, you know, by 2020, uh, costs around open data, um, open data can help reduce costs, sorry, for public administrations, by 1.7 billion uh, a year, and also the market size of open data increasing to 76 billion uh, in 2020. Um, so, very interesting examples. Um, UK companies, from the Open Data Institute, this one is, UK companies producing or investing in open data has combined annual turnover of over 92 billion 
employing over 500,000 people. So basically what they're saying is that open data is generating a you know, private sector market as well, creating jobs. TFL, Transport for London, a fantastic example which we'll talk about because it is social impact and it's, it's many different types of impact. But they've estimated the return on their investment in doing the open data is 58 to 1, which is, which is pretty incredible. Um, and some other examples there to, to kind of note and look at too. So just quickly to, to kind of highlight why there is, a, I suppose, a lack of social uh, examples, social impact examples and quantification of them um, is that there's still an element of novelty of the field of open data, um, which although it's been around for a number of years, I think the sort of groundswell uh, and opinion is that it's still very much an untapped opportunity and, and as it becomes more, more of a tapped opportunity then these type of things will happen. So the novelty of the field feeds into it. And there's also I suppose, inherent difficulties in measuring good governance and social change and attributing it just to the release of data, for example. It could be any number of factors that, that improve uh, an area or, or whatever. So the potential benefit ca categories that we could look to, to kind of quantify is around the education or informing of the citizens so that they can make more informed choices. The promotion of direct civic engagement and increased citizen participation in the democratic process. Um, so interestingly, the Scottish Government has just made a pioneer in open governance, open governance sorry, um, a world pioneer region status. So it will be interesting to see how that develops. Um, the idea obviously being that the, the engagement with the citizen is, is stronger and you, the citizen gets more what they need. You can also gather feedback from policymakers in the private sector and monitor and hold uh, officials and our private sector accountable. So I want to move now, I guess, properly to the, the examples uh, and some real, real great examples in here of driving positive social impact through open data. And they're drawn from across the globe, but you can see, I think, how they, they, they can all relate in the UK. So firstly, if we remember that round all, uh, we're going to look at improving government effectively. So this is a, a lovely example from Nigeria. Um, about understanding government spending effectively. I think criticism was, was rife um, at the amount of transparency there was in terms of government spending. And this budge IT or budget or, or whatever you want to call it um, is, is basically making the case of saying that we'll release more data, uh, make it simple and accessible for citizens to use um, and raising the citizens' ability to demand accountability from public officers. So effectively in, in, in a country that could be seen to be uh, corrupt or, or have uh, problems with corruption, this is the type of information that can help, um, help solve that problem and hold people more accountable. Um, and I'm just looking, looking at some, some more detailed text here on my computer, but it's it says over 270,000 citizens in Nigeria have been effectively reached um, by, this, by this initiative. So that's, that's quite a lot of people. Um, Here's another great example um, from Nigeria looking at using data to help Nigerians track social issues, understand again the importance of government and, and fight corruption. So this is more technical, I suppose, in the example. This is making the data available online again, um, but very much making the data available in API formats, so it's much easier for the developer community to, to use and to integrate the data and to understand, um, understand effectively what's happening. So uh, this, this kind of online available service has mapping tools in it, um, and allows people to download, download the data more easily and in, in a better format for some people. So it's had 40,000 downloads uh, in the last year. Now we're moving across to South America now looking at an example from Chile. Um, and this is about improving participatory, participatory democracy uh, um, and reducing information asymmetries. Um, between the Chilean citizens and their government. 
And so this was developed actually as far back as 2009 um, by the Smart Citizen Foundation. Um, and it's looking at promoting transparency and citizen participation through the use of technology. And it was created as an electoral platform to gather our data on different candidates and thus increase the chances of informed voting. So it was a way that people could put information in about the potential candidates, uh, information that they knew, uh, to try and you know burst the bubble, I guess, on, on what people were, were telling or what was in the press or propaganda uh, to, try and, to try and give people the informed option when it comes to uh, voting. So some of those examples you'll think, well, they're empowered citizens too, and I think uh, it's, it's completely true, but there's a lot of overlap between these government-improving government, government improving principles and the empowered citizen principles. Um, but to try and break it down and make it more accessible um, to understand, we wanted to, to break that down. So now we're looking, moving again, well, it's in South America again, but uh, looking at Uruguay. Um, so this example, it was about making it easier for citizens of Uruguay to view and compare information about their healthcare providers. Um, and in the first month alone, the site received approximately 35,000 visits, um, which was equivalent to 1% of the total population. So you can see there's a massive appetite for it, uh, and the people are also using it. Um, so the, the problem really um, was that it was a mix of public and private healthcare systems. Um, and several factors came into play with people's decision making, uh, including the location of the healthcare provider, the number of doctors available at that location, the hours of opening. Um, and so making that data available as open data um, allowed people to understand where best to go for the healthcare that matched their needs. Um, so obviously we can provide a lot more information on these examples, but I think that's a really nice one. We've then got an example which uh, looks completely differently back, back more to home uh, and in the UK. And this is a NESTA funded uh, open data project uh, which was completed in 2015. Um, but it basically looked at giving, giving youngsters or people between the age of 14 to 16 uh, more information uh, to be able to make really important decisions at that stage in their life. Uh, so to help explore and compare uh, different, different options before they decide on which way to go. Um, and so there's you know, lots of information in there that can be used to help, to help that information. Um, and you can, you can basically go and have a look at that because it's really good to explore through the types of data that are available um, and to, to help consider what options, you know, where you want to go in terms of your job eventually and what skills are available with different types of grades and all that type of stuff. That, you know, having it in one place gives a much better social opportunity and social impact than uh, having to go and do it yourself, effectively. So, from creating an opportunity, um, I mentioned Transport for London's example earlier. This is probably one of the best uh, and most cited examples of open data uh, across the world, to be honest. So, Transport for London, if, if, you don't, if you didn't know, they basically made the decision they were going to release all of their transport data as open data. So that's everything from their live bus information, live uh, metro or, or whatever you call it, underground uh, information. So that's you know the real location of of, uh, of the subway cars and real location of buses and prediction of when these services are going to arrive. Obviously the timetable information and other other pieces of information around uh, how you would travel around London effectively. So they released that as open data. Um, so you can go and have a look at it now, it's open data. If you want to sign up to a feed, you have to put in a couple of pieces of information and you basically get access to that live feed of, of data. So there's been 10,000 developers have done that since they released that. Um, and there's at least 460 applications being used regularly which reach millions of users. And the latest statistics show that over 50% of people in London use one of these applications. So. Transport for London are saving money in not providing you know, a journey planning service, uh, although they still do have, have a service available, but it's being used less and less, and the private sector service is being used more and more. Um, and obviously, Londoners and people that go to London like it, and the city mapper that you can see 
In the bottom right hand corner of the screen there, the city mapper is the one that's got the most traction, the most users, and it really helps you navigate around London uh, very nicely indeed. So in May this year, TfL looked to quantify the benefit, um, and they stated that they believe that there's been £160 million worth of travel time saved by people traveling through London every, every year, um, or in, in the last year effectively, um, by people using the Open Data apps. So the Open Data has, has basically provided this um, £160 million of savings, and that's where that, that very large return ratio comes from, because they obviously had the data already, and the only thing that they really had to invest in doing was making that data available. Um, that was the key thing. So that's fantastic. But what I like about the London example as well is they didn't stop there. Um, they went and asked the user of these applications and the people that travel across London if there was anything missing. And basically what transpired was there was uh, it was great. The apps were available that were great, but they missed, uh, for certain user groups, uh, people with additional accessibility requirements effectively. Um, so you can see here a couple of the applications that were developed off the back of a challenge run. So after, um, after TFL learnt this, they put a challenge out. They said, give us your ideas. The best ideas will fund them and you know, go away and, and, and sort of create them. And there you go. So you can see one there that gives more information about how to access a station, a subway station or a rail station. Um, and the one on the right-hand side, people with, I suppose, different viewing needs uh, in terms of uh, the colour schemes and things like that. So more about creating the opportunity. Now we're going to move slightly across across the North Sea um, to Denmark um, and look at what they've done. So they've embraced open data uh, quite readily. Uh, as, as the UK has, it's fair to say, UK is still one of the leaders in open data. So. It's not that we're really behind the curve, but there's some good examples out there to, to obviously learn from. Um, and the key one here was Denmark's open data, uh, the open address data set. They decided um, back in 2005 to start basically opening up the register of, of uh, buildings uh, and make it free of charge to people um, and to, to businesses. Um, in Denmark and obviously outside Denmark as well, but the study has estimated that direct financial benefits alone for the period um, 2005-2009 are at around £62 million, um, uh, 62 million euros, sorry, at a cost of only €2 million, euros. so that's a, a 30 to 1 return on investment there. Um, and some in other interesting facts that you can kind of look at if you look in more detail at this is that 70% uh, of the users of this information were private companies, um, but 20% uh, came from central government and 10% from municipalities. So there's a benefit there in, in creating innovation, but also in, in sharing the data with other public sector partners as well. Um, so another, another nice example. This is using open data to, to um, help different community groups, I suppose, but really this is a great example of crowdsourced community data as well, acting as open data. But the idea here um, in this food trade element is that the people that want to sell food, um, sustainable food network growers and people like that, that are effectively up against big businesses, have somewhere they can go to, to share what they've got available um, and to therefore sell it. So they become part of a network of organizations, of businesses that want to sell food, um, effectively of food services. Um, and so this food map has been created and it's allowing people to, to use it um, to see where they can where they can sell food or, or where um, where you can buy food, I suppose. Um, and it's just won a, a national tech innovation competition. So got some really good reviews. And then finally moving to the solving public uh, public problems element, um, there's a lot of really good examples around open data being used in critical situations um, to really benefit society. Um, so we've got this improvements in malaria treatment, um, which is, is an example of, of not just open data, but also kind of open 
uh, sharing of, of information and ideas. Um, so effectively it was the open development of malaria drugs um, which, which allowed lots of different organizations to be involved um, in the open source development of anti-malarial drugs um, and as a result four new anti-malarial drugs were developed um, and a box of anti-malarial compounds is freely available to anyone wishing to develop new drugs in developing countries. Um, so the kind of crowdsourcing effectively of knowledge and of development uh, allowed this to, to reach, um, reach more deeply. Um, And then battling Ebola in Sierra Leone, again, uh, it, was a, it was effectively a data sharing crisis. That was one of the biggest problems was a lack of understanding of where the outbreaks were occurring. And so people were crowdsourcing that type of information and where access to care was as well. So by basically sharing that information, making it available, um, it was possible to, to use that to really help uh, tackle the Ebola crisis. Um, and, it, and I know it was used by organisations in the UK looking to understand where to send aid to uh, by looking at this type of information. So you can see in, in times of crisis that open data is very, very useful. And here's another example again um, of open data in times of crisis. This is, go back to the Haiti earthquake um, back in 2010 I think it was. Um, and this is a map, the open street map of of the capital, Port-au-Prince, before the earthquake occurred. Um, now, after the earthquake, immediately after the earthquake, there was a company called GUI, that were a, a spatial um, mapping company that released aerial photography images um, with an open license to allow people to, to map it. Um, and basically, it's a fantastic visualization we can link you to after this, but it shows how quickly the, the open data community map uh, the region. Um, and within a couple of days, the map of that region, I know it's a slightly more zoomed in map, but it looked like that. So there's a massive difference in the quality of the mapping. Um, and this has been used, this was used by, by recovery and disaster recovery teams uh, on the ground using you know, Garmin devices and things like that to actually understand where refugee camps were. You can see the refugee camps there with a little kind of a uh, red, red tent on it, um, where they were and, and how to access them. And you can also see, like, the, for example, the hospital ship on the left in the harbour, which, which allowed people to understand where to go as well. And it keeps on going. There's more examples of uh, open, open information effectively around health care trials. Um, so to make the information open, easy to use, uh, creating a linked database, so that's a really high quality open database that basically allows you to understand the links between different clinical trials uh, across the world. So it might be that the same clinical trials have been taking place in different areas or um, you know, very similar clinical trials. So you can go and you can understand not just what's happened but also the links between what's happened um, and it might, for example, lead you not to, to undertake your own clinical trials because it's already been done in a similar situation elsewhere. Um, and one of the kind of leading to the f one of the few final examples is a lovely lovely one from Manchester, uh, Trafford area of Manchester. Um, and a, a third sector organization um, brought put two pieces of open data together. They brought um, information about where existing defibrillators were uh, in, in the Trafford region and also where people were, were suffering from cardiac arrest, heart attack uh, type conditions. Um, and by using those two pieces of data, we were able to indicate where there was a lack, uh, where there was a gap effectively. And with having that intelligence, they were able to crowdsource more, um, more funding. Um, and they were able to crowdsource funding for 72 defibrillators, which uh, were then applied, deployed on the ground, um, and they have been used to save save lives, uh, for real basically. Um, and there is a picture of a guy, and this is called Staying Alive, so the, the slightly um, embarrassing dance can be done if you want, but that's basically um, s some, some gentleman whose life has been saved because of that defibrillator. So it really crystallizes a great example of how open data can have positive social impact.
and then just a couple of uh, more kind of a little bit more out there examples and um, so I think this is the last one actually um, and this is about basically making open physical activity data um, as a service um, and to help with this uh, people sign up effectively to release their data um, and you know data around their physical activity effectively um, so the infrastructure is there and if your organization your company for example wants to sign up they can do that um, or if individuals want to sign up I think they can do that too and they put in information about their physical activity um, and that's obviously up for anybody to decide to opt in or opt out um, but basically that would be a fantastic resource for practitioners to understand a number of key uh, elements within um, within improving health uh, and how it links with physical activity so it's, it's asking I suppose the community to join it uh, and crowdsource their data you know through existing applications a lot of people collect healthcare data or activity data that, that could be very useful um, and I suppose ideally the idea is that you give your data um, and that you also get something back in terms of you know uh, recommendations on how to improve your health or groups that are available for you to go to and, and things like that so it, it provides a very strong civic engagement um, with between I suppose the user uh, and the healthcare provider as well And just to kind of wrap up in terms of the positive benefits, um, a recent uh, study looked at Open Data Challenge series um, in the UK and it said that for each £1 spent, uh, there could be a generation of £5 to £10 in the UK economy in three years. So again, you're seeing a really good uh, return on investment there uh, for Open Data. So really to, to kind of recap, I guess, um, it's about making data available uh, because that asset is partially unutilized. Uh, it's used for a certain purpose, of course it is, it's collected for a certain purpose um, and it's, it's untapping that resource is the main thing that open data does. Um, and there's also some private sector examples of private sector organizations publishing data um, and making it available uh, which which has helped them as a private sector organization. There's one that I love from New York, uh, a mobile phone company didn't understand, sorry, a, a mobile phone service provider didn't understand why they were getting a really poor uptake in uh, the Korean community uh, and they, they basically released the data sets and were able to understand that it was because uh, the Korean language uh, information they provided was, was actually wrong. Um, and we're able then to, to improve it and improve that take up. So there's some really good examples of how the private sector can use the open data community resource uh, to improve their own services and to benefit as well. Um, so just to wrap up, uh, from an urban tide point of view, we we've delivered those training courses now with 27 events, uh, 317 public sector body uh, organizations uh, sent attendees, um, and we have now completed that, just, just finalizing the uh, evaluation report, which is very positive, thanks, thankful to say. Um, and now uh, Arbitide have some open data opportunities available on our own website. Um, so you can go there and have a look and, and sign up if you're interested or just have a look, obviously. Um, and also in terms of the publication of open data, uh, we're now, we now have available uh, effectively an open data software as a service. Um, platform which allows um, public sector organizations and private sector organizations to put their data on the internet um, in, in just a few clicks and uh, up to 10 data sets um, is completely free uh, forever so it can be used basically as a testing environment to see if it, if it works as well. Um, so really uh, thank you, thank you very much for listening and um, hopefully, hopefully I haven't bored too many people with those examples and uh, there's still some some people around for questions and answers but um, thanks David for the opportunity as well to, to speak um, and like I said just before we started it was great actually researching some of these examples that you want to learn more about because there's some really good examples out there of open data and how it drives uh, social positive social impact um, so thank you. Thank you Stephen, some uh, really interesting and diverse examples there. Um, 
as I was saying uh, just at the start, um, if you have, uh, we will be sharing the slides and the recording of this session f uh, in the follow-up email. If there's any resources or examples that Stephen's uh, pointed out, then could you please list these in the question box and uh, following the webinar, I'll, I'll work with Stephen and we will make sure that we get all these out to you as well so you can have a uh, look around open data. Um, just going straight into the questions, we've got a few questions coming in. If you've got any more, then please put these in the question box as well. Um, the first one's from uh, my colleague Claire, actually. Um, some really interesting examples with lo loads of ideas. Have you been working with any local councils to provide open data? Um, yeah, yeah. I suppose personally, dating back to when we started, uh, the organisation was um, with Glasgow City Council. Um, and more recently, we've been doing work with Perth Think and Ross uh, and Renfrew Share. Um, and I suppose the, the, the piece that we've been doing that's probably most interesting in the last few months with Perth Think and Ross is to look at prioritisation of the data sets that they're going to publish. Um, they kind of know what they've got, uh, which is actually a first step that needs to be taken by a lot of organisations. They know what they've got, but it's about releasing the data sets that maybe are most beneficial first um, and you can do that in a number of ways you can look at other 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 examples where data has been used and say okay it's been used there so let's assume it can be used uh, elsewhere um, or you can look at the ease of, of being able to publish the data sets and because obviously in some cases it can be quite difficult with data locked in back in systems or 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 political sensitivity of data so there's a middle ground to be tread there, but um, I think the most important thing is making sure the data is interesting for people to reuse and it's not just about publishing something that no one wants to see. Um, and also I suppose we've done work with all of the Scottish cities through the Scottish Cities Alliance, um, which was about, uh, and this, this program is developing on for the next few years, but it's about sort of mandating and uh, making uh, the open data approach across all the seven cities more common. Um, so they'll be looking at making sure they publish the same data sets so that people can do work in Dundee, they can also do work in Stirling. Um, and also to, to try and uh, inject more into the community part of it. So for capacity building, skills building and generating a community of open data that can help each other. So really interesting developments in Scotland. And I think Scotland's actually got the opportunity to really really be world leading through that through that initiative um, as well. So yeah. Just a quick follow up to that one, Stephen, um, just from David Brown. Um, what real world examples did Glasgow deliver? Um, so that's a good question, David. Um, in terms of uh, number of data sets, it was up towards 400 at one point. I think it's dropped down to 369, not being involved anymore in that. I don't really know why. Um, a couple of ones that spring to mind that are really useful are they released their live traffic data from their uh, from their loops in the ground, um, which is a fantastic asset that not a lot of organisations have made open. Um, and there was another one to do with uh, stalled spaces, effectively releasing the data and information about stalled spaces helped um, some organisations uh, basically push for PVs, like solar panels, to be installed in the stall spaces. Um, and so the now, now there basically are solar panels in stall spaces generating electricity that wouldn't, uh, you could argue wouldn't be there before without releasing the open data. But um, there are two that spring to mind. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, next question is from Gerard McCormack. Um, what opportunities do you see for open data enhancing community empowerment across Scotland to enable community communities to better participate? Uh, yeah, Gerard, I, I think there's a lot, there's a lot. Um, I think it also needs to be tied in with the Open Government Pilot Pioneer Program from the Scottish Government, um, and I, th I think that's key. I think releasing data is the most important thing is open data. Um, I was at a supply and engagement day in Bristol earlier this year um, and they'd done some work on analysing what people use the data for uh, and the, the most common use of the data by the, by the people that use the open data was for community benefits. Um, so the open, the open data communities there 
the, the drive to benefit the community is is absolutely there. Um, so I think the opportunity is obviously there, but I think what needs to be done is that uh, more organisations need to publish more data, um, and it's data that they already have, so it shouldn't be that difficult. Um, and then to, to build on that kind of civic engagement piece uh, is probably the most the trickiest and the most advantageous element is to make sure there is an engagement around the data so that people get what they need, they get what they want, and they can also bring ideas to the table as well. Yeah, so I think there is opportunity there, um, and and there's a couple of couple of important players, including the Scottish government, that could really really help um, in, in that in that regard. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, next question is Gary Todd. Um, are there any funding opportunities for open data solutions for local government? Uh, he has a national solution and concept, but are struggling to find organisations that could understand the reality of impact this could have. Right, okay, sorry, can you just, uh, we asked the question, David, yeah. sorry, I'm just... Sorry, um, are there any funding opportunities for open data solutions for local government? Um, yeah, I guess uh, not, not overly directly. Um, this the Scottish Government have obviously finished a training, training pilot which was uh, in some way helpful and there's, there's kind of, there's funds in Europe, um, we'll leave that element of it aside, but there are funds in Europe that look at open data um, and, and that kind of thing, but it, it doesn't seem to be that there's too many massive like funds available for open data uh, out there. The Nesta challenge series that did, did a bit of work uh, over the last couple of years in Scotland that we didn't talk too much about there. They were offering that kind of thing. Um, but I think, I would say that's more of a gap in the market, to be honest, than, than being massive. Lots of money out there, unfortunately, uh, to, go and, to go and untap that. There's some, some open source communities uh, out there on open networks that would really help um, in terms of intelligence and and you know, bring people up to speed. But in terms of <coughs> actual funding, I think I think there's a gap there, unfortunately. Yeah. Thanks, Stephen. Next question from Andy McGuire. Um, what are the key things that public sector leaders need to do to f fulfil the potentials of open data? So I think I think Andy, from my opinion, the key thing that they need to do is to be leaders um, and to, to be to offer clear strategic intent. Um, there is the Scottish Government, there's the G8 uh, documentation all out there saying this should be done. There's also legislation through the reuse and public sector information regulations that, that is there. Um, and from the training that we did over the last year, it was clear that the majority of the people that came uh, were not in the, the really high leadership positions that, that would drive this type of, uh, you know, uh, un undying devotion, I suppose, to the open data, and um, I think the real key thing is that these people need to be um, bought into the process and, and articulate that. Um, you know, an open data strategy is very easy to create, um, and also, to be honest, I think an open data publication plan is quite easy to create. To get these documents in place, so there's a reference point, um, and to to do a little bit of visioning. Uh, to understand what the potential benefits could be uh, as well, uh, you know, to give some sort of a light at the end of the, the tunnel and all the work that would need to go on to get to get the data open um, are the key things for me, but, but really being being leaders and offering strategic intent is, is the most uh, pressing. Um, and I, I pull an example, say, from, from Renfrewshire, who very quickly created a fantastic open data strategy, and if you search Renfrewshire open data strategy, you can see it, um, and that, that was great, but unfortunately, um, for resources that, that they ended up, uh, so I'm not parking it as such, but, but key people got put onto other, other areas, um, and this is the kind of thing that I don't think uh, can necessarily happen, I think. Uh, it's really, really great that Renfrewshire are pushing for that, um, and I think that they can they can get a lot of benefit from it. So 
uh, I think they've done the, the key bit in, in you know, being strategically intentful and getting leadership up there. Um, it's obviously necessary to make sure that that kind of thing continues. Thanks, Stephen. Next question is from Cami McKay. Cami McKay, sorry. Um, how is the return of return on investment measured? Right. Okay. So the, I suppose that's that's one of the the issues here um, is that it's difficult to properly measure the return on investment um, across the board. But we transport for London did it. Was obviously that you know looking at the. 160 million in savings of travel time and comparing it to how much they spent on it. Um, and the, through the other examples, you can see the, the Danish example of how much money it cost to um, cost to release certain types of data and how much benefit they believe has happened to the GDP because of it. Um, so you're getting the economic argument again there. Um, and I suppose, not that it's done very often, but if you looked at examples of, of the, the Ebola case study whereby you could maybe indicate how many lives have been saved or, um, or that type of thing, then very quickly you could uh, identify the, the benefit uh, in terms of a cost because we know that we can attribute um, cost uh, positives to, to people's lives being saved. Um, so I think that's an area for open data to look at more um, because uh, in some cases it's difficult to, to definitely attribute the open data benefit to the, the benefit, um, but th it's worked up in a number of ways. I suppose is the best way to say it at the moment. There's no there's no key core standard around that. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, next question is from my colleague Claire again. Um, public sector agencies okay. to have open data strategies in place by 2015. How far along are organisations to having these in place? Uh, okay, Claire. So I, I think you're just asking for a kind of a general, in terms of Scottish organisations. Um, over the last year, more and more, I have started putting them in place. I think that there's probably um, a, around sort of a quarter to a third, maybe now, of public sector organisations in Scotland with them in place. Um, I think probably the, the NHS cover themselves quite well through. You know the ISD and their and their joint sort of sort of board, um, which means that you could arguably cover a lot more of the NHS organisations. But um, you know they've got that central piece, but actually the regional areas don't seem to have those those in place. Um, from local government perspective, there's a lot of examples out there that are that are in place, um, and then other public bodies. There's some key ones I think that, that work with data and data as their day to day job almost like. National Libraries in Scotland, for example, that have one in place, um, and then others that maybe they use data, but it's not maybe their day job, uh, are maybe a little bit further behind. But I'd say about a quarter of public sector organisations, and if, depending on how you count it, I think it was about 150, 151 or whatever. I think at least a quarter of them now have one in place. Thanks, right, Stephen. Um, and back to David Brown. Um, in the, Traf the Trafford example, how did they, re they release the personal data on who had had heart attacks in what area? Um, yeah, so I, they, they didn't release the personal data, so they, they basically looked at aggregating the type of uh, heart attack information up to a number that was permissible, I suppose. Um, and, you know, the, the NHS do this a lot with a, a figure that should be not less than five. Um, so by doing that, um, you can you can get an understanding of of the sort of gaps and issues. Um, and if a number, for example, is, is lower than five, uh, then then you could assume uh, that maybe that's that's an area uh, that doesn't doesn't need it. But basically, it's it's about making sure you release the data in a way that doesn't uh, worry anyone's personal information um, and so, so that's that's how that kind of open data set was set up um, and uh, what the what the NHS do in, in, in this example as well is you uh, basically aggregate up until you get to a number uh, that is you know five or higher um, 
So that was that, was that David. Thank you, thank you, Stephen. Um, that seems to be all the questions for just now. Um, just as I mentioned at the start um, of the webinar, we were, this is a recorded session and we'll be sharing the slides, uh, recording and other resources. The easiest way to access these is to join the Change Managers Network group on Knowledge Hub. This is the, also the group which, this webinar se which underpins this webinar series. Um, following, this, following the close of this webinar, there will be a short survey. We're constantly looking to find out how we can improve the series, find out what kind of speakers you'd like to hear, and also get feedback for our speakers going forward. So um, if you could please take the time to fill that out, then that would be greatly appreciated. Um, our next webinar will be ne at the end of next month. It will be hosted by Rich Knight um, on systems thinking within the Environment Agency. Um, so I will also include a link to join that webinar in the follow-up email that will go out following this session. Um, I'd like to thank Stephen uh, for giving up his time to present today. It was very interesting for me and I hope that you all enjoyed the session as well. Um, so thank you very much for attending and I hope to see you sometime soon. Thank you.